but let's go ahead and get started. So if we look here um, on the first one, we've got a good leaving group on a secondary position, right? If we look at our reagents, remember potassium is positive, iodine is negative, iodine is a halide, good nucleophile. We have an aprotic solvent. Right? So if we got a good nucleophile, right? And we've got a good leaving group on a secondary position. This sure looks like an SN2. And in an SN2, what I'm gonna end up with is inversion, right? So the iodine will replace the tosylate. In the second one, I have water and sulfuric acid. Those together, right? Remember, is H3O plus. I've got a primary and tertiary uh, carbon, right? So if we think about this, this is going to be a hydration and acid with water is going to go through a carbocation. Okay. And this is important because if you have a carbocation, you have rearrangement. Is there any reason for this tertiary carbocation to rearrange? Well, no, right? I've got a secondary and I've got a secondary. That is the most stable. There's really no reason for it to rearrange. So then I'm going to add at that most substituted position. So this is a Markonikov addition. I'm going to add the OH and you know, no stereo control. Okay, questions about that one. So if you had the concentrated H2SO4 on that one, it would go backwards, right? Yeah, so, but what, the way you would show that is just, um, right, H2SO4 on above the arrow and no water shown, right? So you could, you could reverse that uh, a dehydration um, through an E1 mechanism. Um, but, uh, well, that's complicated. All right. So good question. What would happen? So if I had added this, right, and then I had done H2SO4, right, concentrated, this would go through an E1 mechanism, right? An E1 mechanism is always Zaitsev. What's the Zaitsev product here? Well, the Zaitsev product is the most substituted product and the most substituted product is this one, right? So if I wanted to reverse this, right? So reversing with H2SO4 actually doesn't give me the same product. I could turn the alcohol back into the double bond, but I have to first do the tosyl chloride in pyridine and then I'd have to do uh, a small base to get the Hoff, uh, no, not small base. I want a bulky base. To get the Hoffman product. So good point. You usually can reverse these, but in this case, the reverse is actually going to give you a different regiochemistry, right? So we can form the alcohol, we could dehydrate the alcohol, but in this case, dehydration is E1, E1's always SATSEF, and SATSEF would give me a different regiochemistry. But good point, but watch your regiochemistry. If we look at the next one, the next one we have, a, we've got an alkene, right, to an alcohol. This is a technique that I would suggest you start doing. Write down what the functional groups is. That'll help you remember. Often, uh, many of us are verbal. Uh, I'm more visual. That's why I like organic chemistry. But if you're verbal, putting the words alkene and al alcohol down is going to help. The other thing you need to know is where did I add it to? And I added it to the least substituted side. Least substituted side mean, means that I need an anti Markonikov addition. Okay, adding an alcohol, anti-Markonikov addition, 
The only one that does that is hydroboration oxidation. Right? And that's how I end up with my product. So I want uh, BH3 and THF followed by basic hydrogen peroxide. Okay, questions about these three? Okay, the other two alcohol formations from alkenes would have been Markonikov, so it's therefore the water and the oxymercuration, demercuration would not have been um, the right answer. Okay, okay so we have a uh, exam coming up on Friday. Okay, there is a practice quiz up. It's not for a grade. Right? That's just to let you see what the exam will be like so that you have, um, uh, you'll, you'll have an idea of what it'll look like. The ex exam will be on Friday. It'll be during class time. I will open it just a little bit early, right? You'll have 60 minutes. It's probably gonna have a uh, 20, Five questions. Let's say 25 to 30 questions. Um, if it has 25 questions, there'll be four points each. If they're 30, that'll be 3.33. So um, I'll see, I'll, I'll look at it and see, um, but we'll be 25 to 30 questions, uh, 60 minutes. So even at 30 questions, that's two minutes per, per uh question. It's going to be uh, cover chapters six, seven, and eight. We'll finish chapter eight today. No, it is closed note. No Google. No Chegg. No roommate. No uncle. I did have an uncle do a test once. No, uncle. Um, let's see. You can have scrap paper. Right. Uh, you will be. You won't be on Zoom at the same time. Uh, this is all. The, this list here is hopefully you have the integrity of to do this and understand that by doing this, you're gonna be in good shape. The downside of cheating on an online exam in organic one is that when you get to an organic two and the exams are in person, uh, you will not have learned all the information you need to be successful in organic two. So at some point this is gonna, if you decide not to have good academic integrity, it will come back to, uh, well, to get you. So uh, follow the rules. Um, I'm trusting you. Um, and like I said, not everybody's gonna have the same exam. Um, all the question types, if there's a question about, high, uh, about you know, al alkenes to alcohols, there may be three to six versions of that. Uh, you'll get one of those versions, okay? You do not need the lockdown browser. No. This is okay. I would get a piece of paper for you to write on. Uh, it's going to help a lot. The practice quiz is closes uh, Wednesday night. Um, and again, it's just for your practice. You can answer it three times. It's going to be the same way that I show the test. So it's only one question at a time. Um, if you're not aware, that's, that's to help with. Uh, integrity. Um, so scrap paper is a good, uh, no lockdown browser. So if you want to take it on your iPad or I wouldn't take it on my phone, you can. But okay, any other questions about the exam? I will try to get the uh, exam one grades up 
uh, I've been trying to <laughs> set aside time, but I'll try and get those uh, up. Um, I'm not sure if you can go back to a previous question uh, whenever it's locked down to one at a time. Um, you might want to try that on the quiz because I'm setting it up the same way. Yeah, I'm not sure you'll be able to go back and change an answer. Yeah, check it on the quiz. Check it on the quiz whenever you're going through. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and move forward. Finish up chapter eight. We got a couple of questions. Um, we got a couple of of reactions, and then we're going to look at some synthetic strategies, and then we'll uh, do some some more practice on Wednesday. We'll do review. Okay. So last thing we need to do in this chapter is oxidative cleavage. What happens is an oxidative cleavage is that we are cleaving right across that double bond right? and then just adding an oxygen. So in this case, we have a ketone and an aldehyde. The way this works is that when we put the uh, double bond in with the ozone, it goes through a process. The book has the process. I'm not gonna expect you to recreate it, so I'm not gonna go ahead and show it here, but it is important to know that you make this ozonide. So you can see at this point that ozonide, we've already cleaved that carbon-carbon bond. Okay. So by making this ozonide, we've already really taken care of breaking that apart. Then at that point, we can put in a mild reducing agent. To then reduce the ozonide, so we're actually reducing it down to the ketone and misdrew this. And in this case, the aldehyde. And whether it's a ketone or an aldehyde will depend on, on its substitution pattern. You could end up with two aldehydes. You could end up with uh, two ketones. You could have, end up with a ketone and aldehyde. Okay. The mild reducing agents I don't know why I put MIDI, uh, mild reduction agents going to be uh, DMSO, I mean DMS, which is dimethyl sulf uh, sulfur. The resulting product after it's it's been oxidized, after it's reduced the oxygen, is that it becomes DMSO. But that that's uh, dimethyl sulfur, and the other possible reagent is just zinc and water. So you can just put zinc. Sometimes you'll see zinc and acid, but it does it's not necessary. It's just zinc. And I don't know what I did there. Now this one is an important one because it's the first time we've really seen a carbon-carbon bond breaking reaction. Uh, yes, I'll try and get the exam grades up. Uh, thanks, Adam, uh, for answering that one. I'll try and get them up uh, before Wednesday so you can check over them and let me know if they're right. Okay, so, so the 
important part about this one is it's the first time that we see a bond bond cleavage reaction. So there's a couple of important, right? We've got things to watch for are additions. Give myself enough room there. Right? So adding carbons, going from three carbons to four carbons. Right, this one that we're looking at, we're going from four carbons to three carbons. Are those X's halides? Just halides, leaving groups. In fact, let's just let's take off the halides and let's put Y groups. Just some some group group there. Generic. We haven't seen really an addition yet. We will see one later. Um, and then, um, but whenever you notice one of these, you should you should highlight it, right? So, if you'll notice, most of what we've done so far, in most cases, right, is just either a functional group change. Right, we're changing an alkyl halide to an alcohol, we're changing an alkene to an alcohol, an alcohol to an alkene, an alkene to an alkyl halide, right? We're really changing the functional group, but we're not changing the carbon structure, right? So the carbon structure remains the same. We have seen rearrangements, right, with carbocations. So we've seen some rearrangements. We really haven't seen an addition yet. We'll see those in the next chapter. We'll see some carbon carbon additions. And then this is the first example of really a subtraction. So I can change the carbon I, our abstraction um, and rearrangement, right? So So oxidative cleavage could both be of subtraction. Right, so up here, right, it's of subtraction. I more or less go from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons. To three carbons. And four carbons. Or it could be a rearrangement. So if we look at this structure, we're going to get oz ozonolysis, right? So let me spell that. Lysis means breaking. If we look at this one, we get cleavage across that double bond. Right, that gives us the double bond here. Right, but that's not the way we normally show that. We normally show this, and now let's number them. One, two, three, four, five, six. Right, so we've now numbered So we've now changed the carbon structure. The carbon structure is not a ring anymore. now it's open. so this is a this is a rearrangement. So we see the subtraction right here. we lo lose the other side as formaldehyde. So we go to three carbons. 
or we can see this as a rearrangement. So ozonolysis, this oxidative cleavage is important from this standpoint. The other thing that ozonolysis is interesting is uh, if you've ever been to SeaWorld or something like that, they actually use seawater in their, their tanks. What they do is they take that seawater and they actually bubble ozone through it. What the ozone does is anytime that there is a double bond in any species, right, anything that's in there, bacteria or whatever, it cleaves it, which really means that the lipids, which almost all lipids have uh, some type of saturation, saturation means double bond, it actually cleaves it, which more or less kills any living organisms, but leaves all the salts and all the, the, the small nutrients. And so therefore we can get rid of all the bacteria and fungi and everything uh, coming out. Uh, the top one is seven. And this one's seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But in the ring, one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm not counting this carbon. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Again, just from oxygen to oxygen, not counting this carbon. So seven, seven, seven. Okay. All right, questions? This one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, seven carbon. All right. Okay. All right, let's try a couple of these. And then we'll start looking at uh, synthetic strategies. Right, so when I see the ozone, ozone, right, I know this is ozonolysis. Ozonolysis is oxidative cleavage. So I'm going to break that double bond, put a double, an oxygen there. So I'm going to keep the double bond, but I'm going to replace and break it, put an oxygen on one side. And in this case, we get formaldehyde on the other side. In some cases, right, especially with these small molecules, they will focus on larger molecules. So if you ever see a problem where it doesn't show the, the small carbon, that is considered like a, a reducing the carbon structure by one. And so that you sometimes you'll see problems uh, in books that won't have it. Okay. In the second one, right, again, we're getting an ozonolysis. So we're going to cleave that right there. I'm going to number this to make this easier. So we're going to draw five carbons. Go one, two, three, four, five. And we'll see. On two, I've got a methyl group. Right on one, I've got an oxygen. And on five, I've got an oxygen. And then by kind of convention, whenever you have an aldehyde, you show the H, right? So therefore you can go back and show that H there. Sometimes you'll see books that don't show the H. Uh, it is convention when you have an aldeh aldehyde to show an H uh, on there, okay? Questions about these? Last two sections in the book, one is talking about predicting products and the other is synthetic strategies. Like with the last chapter, it's helpful to kind of think about what your steps are to figure these out. First is what's your reagent?
You know, what is what is being added? Some of these, right? You're gonna know what the mechanism is. Right, so some of these have a very uh, straightforward nucleophile, electrophile, leaving group type mechanism. Uh, some of these are going to not have a mechanism, but have a, a tell. Right, so, so if it has lots of oxygen, uh, it's probably gonna be an oxidation. Right, if it has hydrogen, probably gonna have addition of hydrogen, right? So whenever you, uh, whenever you look at these, some of these are not going to have mechanisms where you can work it out. But when you're going through these and working the problems, always look for something that can give you a hint. Like if it's got water, you're probably going to maybe be adding water. Right. If it's got hydrogen, you're going to be adding hydrogen. The second thing you need to think about is what is the regioselectivity? Right. So as these are occurring, right, always ask yourself, right, is this a Marco or anti Marco? Right. So be thinking about that. The only time this isn't going to play is if the molecule's perfectly uh, symmetric. And then what is uh, what is the expected stereochemistry? So is it going to be anti, right? Is it going to be sin? Is it going to have, you know, no control or carbocation, right? Carbocation is going to be planar. So it's going to be multiple, right? So, so when we're looking at the reagents, we can think about, you know, what type of reagents there is there. If there's a mechanism, start working through the mechanism. Uh, lots of oxygens, hydrogen. And then for each one of these, you really need to be thinking about what's my regioselectivity and then what's my stereoselectivity, okay? So I'm gonna put a set of problems, kind of use this idea to predict your products. And again, I'll try and give you a minute after I get these on here. So do try uh, to work these out. The more times you try and work these out, the more uh, the better this will become uh, something that your brain will think you need to remember, and it will start creating synapses. And the way you do that is you recall, right? You recall things over and over again, not by reading them, but try and ask yourself a question. If you get bored asking yourself a question, hopefully you have a friend in the class, then they can sit down and ask you questions. You can even do this through Zoom. So I'm going to take a minute um, and let's let's try and, and get as many of these done as you can.
Okay. Well, let's take a look at the first one. Again, let's analyze the reagent. So the reagent MCPBA, right? So there's several ways to do this. Uh, PBA stands for peroxy benzoic acid. And I might know that peroxy acids form epoxides. The other way to think about this one is what is this look like? And this is metachloro, metachloro benzoic acid, peroxy benzoic acid, right? And if you draw this out, you might remember that this structure here creates epoxides. Right? So the first step here is that I'm gonna create an epoxide. So I'm gonna create epoxide. Epoxides, the oxygen is on both sides. So the regioselectivity here is that it's adding to both sides, right? But the oxygen is three member ring, so it has to add to the same side. I'm not gonna have the oxygen on one side and the other in a small little three member ring. And then the second step, right? H3O plus, okay? This is gonna give me a ring opening. I could work through the mechanism here. I'm not gonna do it right now, but this is one that you could work through the mechanism to understand what's happening. Um, and because this oxygen on one side, I'm gonna have to ring open this, the ring opening has to happen from the back side. So therefore my OH here going up and my OH here going back, right? This is gonna be anti. So I have no regioselectivity per se, but I am going to have anti-addition, okay? And then the anti-addition is going to give me this plus it's an antimer, right? But I won't have any diastereomers. Okay, questions about this one? What, what's being added at the end? Uh, this right here, that's, uh, I just, that's abbreviation for an antimer. Thank you. Yeah, so you can have you can have the two OHs the opposite direction, but they'll always be anti, right? I could have I could have the one that's back forward and the one that's forward back. Well, here it might just be easier to do it this way. Okay. In the second one, right, we have hydrogen, palladium. This is going to be catalytic hydrogenation. And again, when you're practicing these, write these things down, make notes, right? This is a catalytic hydrogenation. That's gonna mean that I add two hydrogens across, right? So that's, that's uh, like I said before. And then when we look at the reagent here, remember that this has to add the two hydrogens to the same side, which will give me this one. This happens to be a meso compound, so I don't have an enantiomer. Um, but I get the hydrogens added across, so this is CN. So there's no regio chemistry because I'm adding two hydrogens, right? But I do have a CIN addition for stereospecificity. The next one, we're looking at oxygen, right? We got this osmium tetraoxide, right? We see this, this is the dihydroxylation, right? It's got several different reagent mixtures, but it's really seeing those four oxygens attached to either osmium or manganese, right? If I see that, that's a dihydroxylation and that is a specific dihydroxylation, it's SIN. So what's happening here is that I end up with both OHs going up. right, getting me this product. And again, no regio chemistry here because I'm adding two OHs, um, but there is syn addition. So the first three really was focused on, on the stereochemistry. This last one, right, we do have the possibility of working out the mechanism here. That gets me to this position. I add my hydrogen to create the most stable carbocation. 
and then the chlorine. That's now the nucleophile. Nucleophile attacks the carbocation, the electrophile. And that gives me, this is my product. And there's no stereo control. Right, because this is planar. And this is planar. Which means the hydrogen could have added to the top or the bottom, and then the chlorine could come in and add to the top or the bottom. Okay. Questions so, about this set? So the yes, last one is that a dimethyl or just the alkene, the double bond on the benzene? The there's no benzene on the six member ring. Yeah. Well, it's just a double bond right here. Oh, okay. okay. So there's a methyl. Yeah. So when it gets reduced, right, it turns into a methyl. So it's a methylene here, it becomes a methyl. Okay. All right, other, other things we need to be thinking about. Um, the last section in the book on this chapter is synthetic strategies. First one is moving a leaving group. Or you can think about it as a location of functional group. And remember, uh, we looked at this in, at the end of chapter seven, which is this big fat arrow. What does this big fat arrow mean? Right, this is a retrosynthesis arrow. So when I see this arrow, that means this is my target and this is my starting material. So the, another way to show this would have been, how do I get from here, right? Using as many steps as I need to get to here. How do I move that bromine? Well, if we think about that, I should be able to take this to that, right? I should be able to go there to the alkene and I should be able to go from the alkene to the bromide. If we think about this, this is the most substituted. So this is SATSEF, uh, SATSEF, right? And then here we are adding the bromine to the most substituted side on that double bond. So this is a Markonikov. So I need an elimination. Right, followed by an addition. And what I'm looking for is I'm looking for an elimination that's going to favor Satsef's product. Right. And then I'm going to look for um, a, an addition that is going to be Markonikov's. Now for the elimination, would I want E1 or E2? So E1, right, this is a secondary, E1 would be a little bit uh, difficult, but it could work. But what's the problem with E1? What is E1 always in competition with? E1 is always in competition with SN1, right? They go through a carbocation, they're always going to be in uh, uh, competition with SN1. So therefore, when we're trying to do an elimination, if there's any way we can do it E2, we want to do it E2. So how do we go from this bromide to the SATSEF product? 
Well, what I want to use is I want to use a small good base, right? So either potassium or sodium methoxide, right? So if I have a secondary position with a strong small base, right, I'm going to get the SATSEP product. Right? If I had done this with a big bulky base, right, then I could have gotten the Hoffman product. Right, so by being able to go through E2, either Saitsef or Hoffman selectively, right, I can end up with two different versions here. In E1, right, I can only do Saitsef, but on E2, I can either do Saitsef, right, or Hoffman. So I'll want to do. reduction with you know, potassium or sodium methoxide, that's gonna get me to this position. And then how do I go from this to a Merkonikoff addition of the bromide? Well, this one is straightforward. This is the HBR, right? That goes to the carbocation. Carbocation goes to the most stable side, right? And I end up with, with the bromine at the more substitute position. So what I've done through this transition is I have relocated, I've moved my leaving group, my functional group by going through the going through the alkene. Okay, questions about this strategy. Similar strategy again. Remember, this is a retrosynthesis, so that means this is my target. This is my starting material. So if we start here, if we had added HBr, right, we're going to go to this bromide. And then elimination of this bromide is only going to only going to either end up with the same product or right end up with elimination this way which doesn't get us to the to the right place okay so therefore instead of markonikovs i have to do anti markonikovs now there's a couple of ways i could do this right um we could do it with hbr and the radical right that would have given me this okay or and although we've seen this this really is in the radical chapter so the book doesn't tend to use this one very much in this chapter uh, so therefore i i won't highlight it until we get to radicals but i can all i really need is an anti-marconikoff right so what's the other anti-marconikoff addition i can do well i could do the hydro of the hydroxide, right? I could add the hydrogen. So hydroboration oxidation. So BH3 and THF followed by sodium hydroxide and hydrogen peroxide. Again, when you're doing this, right, one of the things you can do is uh, is get is say these things in your mind. Yeah, I'll try and post the homework uh, this afternoon. I have a break uh, before one o'clock. So I'll I'll try and get the homework up today. Okay, so if we look here, then that's gonna give us the OH there, right? Now that's not a good leaving group. So what I'll need to do is take this and turn it into a good leaving group. How do we do that? Well, we make the tosyl chloride, right? We turn this sulfonate. That's gonna turn this into OTS, right? And then we need to eliminate to give 
this side, right? This is a Hoffman alkene, right? We're, we're eliminating to the least substitute side, which means I need a good bulky base. So here I can use the Antimarkonikov addition followed by elimination to the Hoffman side to get the change in the double bond, relocation of my double bond. Okay. Now in the book, one of the good things, one of the nice things about this book is that it kind of distills everything down at the end of the chapter. So if you haven't noticed yet, it has these big things here. Now, what I would suggest doing with all three chapters is to find these at the back of the book, create the pinwheel, right? but leave off the reagents, okay? And then come back a little bit later and put in the reagents. The other thing that I would suggest is, if you haven't started making flashcards, please do. This is a good time to do them. But the way I'd suggest making the flashcard is on the front, put a question mark there on the back, the way your brain works is, is through recall, right? So what you wanna do with your flashcards, what you wanna do with something like this big pinwheel is not stare at it, but make your mind recall it. The more your mind has to recall it, that's why doing practice problems helps. Right, the more mind, so what you wanna do is you wanna ask your mind questions, right? Create this big pinwheel, right? But leave off all the reagents. Then make another pinwheel where you put in all the reagents, set it aside for a little while, then come back and put in the products, right? Make flashcards where the front has the answer on the back. And then you can turn that flashcard around, that whole deck around and you can do them the other way so that you can see the other way. Uh, the pinwheels are always in the last section. So after last section, right before the problems, there's there's like it distills the entire chapter down into the specifics. Um, and so you'll see that in chapter seven, there's a pinwheel like this. Chapter eight, there's a pinwheel. Chapter six, it's more of here's S and one, here's S and two, here's E two, here's here's E one. Uh, but you'll see these kind of condensed. They take the whole chapter and they condense it down into a few graphics, so, which is not a bad practice. Okay, uh, that looks like we're